Good evening, church family. Uh, it is Wednesday night. Um, of course, that is our uh, Bible study night. Um, we are back in Acts, of course, Acts chapter 8. Um, before we get there, uh, I got a lot, few things I want to talk about and, and uh, just kind of, um, kind of a testimony right off the bat, a really simple one, just really simple one. And it, and it kind of goes back maybe probably about a week ago, maybe a little bit more. Um, I was actually praying and I was becoming kind of upset about this whole COVID-19 thing, you know, the, the coronavirus and, and becoming frustrated. And it, and it wasn't just, I wasn't just because of the, the virus that's out there, you know, that, that's, of course, it's frustrating, but I mean, you can't really do really anything about that. But it, I guess it was, it was a kind of the reaction to what was going on and, and there was starting to kind of have this feeling of um, people were kind of getting upset and mad um, that some churches were still meeting. Um, some of the political leaders were telling churches to close their doors and, and other religious people uh, condemning pastors that wanted to still have a service. And they were using it as more like, well, you're only wanting a service because you're wanting tithes and offerings or, uh, or maybe anything else that may be kind of in a sense, a sinister way of looking at it. And this, this was starting to kind of feed into the media and going back and forth. And we're seeing stuff on Facebook. We're seeing just all these different things. And, and guys, I got to tell you right now, I started becoming really angry, started becoming really upset and mad and just frustrated. And I'm like, you know, uh, do they not know that there are people out there that, that have, Man, they they haven't seen anybody in forever. I mean, in six weeks, seven weeks, you know, do, do they know that there's people out there that don't know technology. I mean, I think everybody's like, oh, everybody knows technology, but there's people that that they don't have that capability. They're still wanting to meet. They're still wanting to hear the word of God preached. Hear the songs of hearing songs for their heart, songs that are praising God. And guys, I was, as I was praying, I was sitting there praying, and, and, and this anger started feeding into my prayer. And, and, and guys, I, I'll tell you, I, I, just, I, I, I just even in the midst of praying, I was just becoming more angry and angry. And, and, I, and, I, and then I started arguing. I started arguing with political leaders. I started, I started ar making up fictitious people and imagining these fictitious people. And I was going to be an, av you know, they're, they're, they're my adversary. And I was going to yell and scream at them and, and, and tell them what it is and, and, and what they, you know, what we, what we believe and all this stuff. And, and, uh, it's <laughs> trying to defend my God, trying to defend my God, not really trying to defend my faith. Because I know that's biblical, but, but I was trying to defend my God. I feel like my God was being wronged, and I needed to defend him. As I was praying, <laughs> and as I was praying there, and, and, and saying all these things, and getting all worked up, and... and, 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 and just giving one for one, just rah, just yelling and screaming almost in my head. Uh, I heard a voice come over. And as I was praying, I heard this voice say, I, I, I don't need to be defended. I need to be recommended. I stopped. I smiled. Peace came over me. God, our Father, can defend himself. We need to show through our life and, and how we speak to those that are lost. And we need, to, we need to show this true grace and love of God's power and mercy. We don't need to defend him. We need to recommend him. This time even more so, guys. During this time, people need to hear that there is hope more than anything. 
you know, it's interesting about the, 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 the Bible study tonight over in Acts. It's, it's, it's so cool because even last weekend when it was, when it was Passover, Pastor Brandon was, did a wonderful message and, and it was overcompassing all this stuff that was going on. And, and the cool thing is it was right in the midst of Passover and, and talking about the Passover lamb and all the, it was right there in the midst of everything that was being spoken. And then as I preparing for today, I'm hearing this, this message coming across and, and, and guys, I, I, man, it's such a cool thing because, um, we're, we're seeing this time period right now where there's, I, and I, I do believe there's some persecution of the church, but, but it's also because there's, there's some other things kind of going on and, and, and we're, we're seeing this faith call throughout like Facebook and other places. This, this call to our faith and, and during this time we need to be in prayer and we need to, we need to be praying and, 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 and seeking God during this time. We need to kind of get things right in our own homes and our families. Start looking at what the priority is. I want to back up a little bit because tonight we're supposed to be going over Acts 8. But I want to back up just a tad uh, into Acts chapter 7. I'm not going to be in there very long. So just bear with me. <laughs> uh, I just want to pinpoint some things real quick in this. Because we, we see the end, and, and Pastor Brandon did a wonderful job. I mean, just this was huge, guys. I mean, I, I, bless his heart, he had probably one of the largest chapters to really uh, do a Bible study over in a, in a long time. And, and he did a wonderful job trying to get through it all. And this last part, I, I really want to emphasize something here. And this last part from uh, Acts chapter 7, 54 through uh, 60, we see the first martyr for Christ, um, the first martyr of the Christian church during this time. Um, I mean, even though we, we know what was going on, but the, the Stephen's account, Stephen's sermon, his accusation and charge of, of the, the people, of them doing wrong, the, the leaders or the Sanhedrin doing wrong um, to what they did to Jesus. And he, he gives this full account, Stephen does. And it's beautifully done. And honestly, uh, we, we did study over it one time, and it was just how how he developed this argument, almost like a lawyer would, would develop an argument um, for the case of Christ in a sense. And, and we see this, and what's really cool is, is, is we see this full account, and he gives this full reasoning why Jesus is the one, is the Messiah. And then at the very end, and, and this is not the cool part, <laughs> For say, but is what happens, what God does in this moment, which makes it just uh, amazing. And and guys, let me bear with me when I say this: is as Stephen Stephen was uh, finishing up, and he gave his kind of his last account, and he honestly kind of um, at the very end really kind of stuck it to them. <laughs> and, and you can see that if, if verse 51, going back a little bit further, you stiff necked people with uncircumcised ear hearts and ears. I mean, this was a, a direct attack, um, to the, the Jews. Um, and, and you can tell that right after that is because you, you see this, they become enraged and they start gnashing their teeth at him, which is a sign of anger. I would imagine it's like where you, uh, you know, kind of grip your teeth. Stephen continued by saying, he, he said, look, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. And they know he's talking about Jesus. They know that he's talking about that, that Jesus is there amongst God. And that would have just enraged them. Calling it blasphemy in a sense. And it says in the scripture, after, they, uh, after they, they filled with rage, they dragged Stephen out of the city and began to stone him. 
And you might have thought, well, you know, you might have read this text and go, well, why did they stone him? There is a reason for this, actually, in, in Scripture. And if you actually ever researched that, you would know, you would agree with me. And, and I think you would see this, you know, out of Leviticus 24, 14 through 16. I'll read it for you. It says this. Ah, uh, the Lord spoke to Moses, bring the one who has cursed, uh, who was, who has cursed, uh, to the outside of the camp, have all who heard him lay their hands on his head and have the whole community stone him. Verse 15, and tell this, uh, tell the Israelites, if anyone curses his God, he will bear the consequences of the sin. Whoever blasphemies the name of the Lord must be put to death. The whole community is to stone him. If he blasphemies the name, he is to be put to death, whether the resident alien or the native. We see the same thing in Deuteronomy 13.10. It says, Stone him to death for trying to turn you away from the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt out of the place of slavery. We look at the same thing, Deuteronomy 17. And also we could go a little bit farther into this. Is, this is 2 through 5. It says, If a man or woman among you in uh, in one of your towns of that the Lord, will your God, will give you to discover doing evil in the sight of the Lord, your God, and violating his covenant, and has gone to serve other gods by bowing in worship to the sun, moon, and all the stars in the sky, which I have forbidden. And if you are told or heard about uh, hear about that then investigate it thoroughly if the report turns out to be true that is detestable act this detestable act has been uh, done in Israel you are to bring out to your city gates uh, that man or woman who has done this evil thing and stone them to death So here's the question. My question is, is, did these people do right in the sight of God? <laughs> we, we know the accounts of Stephen was telling the truth. We, we know that. I mean, we as Christians, we believe that Stephen was telling the truth. Uh, and at the time, and... and um, but but the people themselves did they did they believe Stephen was accurate? Did they believe that Stephen was telling the truth? It's interesting, is because um, how often we hear today we'll see other Christian believers telling other Christian believers that they're wrong. That they're wrong. You don't you don't know what I know. You're not educated as much as I am educated. But we read the scripture. Well, I, I have read some other commentary that explains that differently. But I'm reading the scripture. Well, you don't know it in the Greek. But I'm reading the scripture. These people that stoned him believed in their mind, maybe even in their heart, that they were doing God's work. Because what Stephen was saying was insulting their ears. But their hearts were hardened. Have you ever heard of, have you ever had anybody tell you that you were doing wrong? What's the first thing you do when you hear that you did something wrong you defend your act right off the bat well that's how i was taught or that's that's what i was told to do or that's what so and so told me to do you start defending your own well, i mean that's that's the way i made the decision instead of owning it and going yeah i probably made a mistake on that or yeah you're right that was pretty dumb uh our first moment our first inkling our first of is like say no 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 Casting judgment to everybody else except for ourselves. And we see this with the people. I mean, they, they, 
they immediately thought that this person had to be wrong. Because it was bringing insult to them. God can defend himself. There's a, uh, I teach an ethics class and, and there is, um, there's a expression, I, I, I can't think of who actually quoted it, so I, 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 I'm hopefully going to do it justice, but there's a quote that I read and it was sometimes, oh, here it goes, uh, just because it's right doesn't mean it's the right thing to do. And I thought about that a couple of times. I'm like, well, what does that really mean? Just because it's right doesn't mean it's the right thing to do. Just because we have the right to assemble as a church um, during the coronavirus, <laughs> just because we have the right to do it doesn't mean it's the right thing to do. I think everybody would agree with that. And there's, there's something to be said about that. I mean, I think we, we get to this point and, and we see this in this action just because they had the right to stone Stephen. It probably wasn't the right thing to do. Or at least in their minds, they think they had the right to stone Stephen. What's interesting at this time is this entrance into this new character, Saul. And we know who Saul is. Saul becomes Paul later on. But Saul enters into this, into the the story at this time in Acts. And he enters in and, and, and he begins seeing that he declares a mission from God that he needs to right the wrong of this man called Jesus. He decides that he needs to take it upon himself to cleanse the Jewish people and to bring right back to what it was. It's interesting that we see some of these same people today that believe, well, ah, this charismatic movement is, is, is bad. Well, why? I mean, there's a lot of charismatic movements that happen in here. Well, you know, you don't, you don't believe how I believe. Okay. But I still have scripture there. And so we see this. And it's interesting because I've heard people, guys, I'm going to be honest with you, I have friends that I, I, I love talking with, I love debating with, and the one thing that gets me is this, is uh, <laughs> I, I see a lot of them quoting people, but rarely ever quoting scripture. If you're quoting, and, and I want to point this out to anybody, if you're quoting everybody else and not quoting scripture, then I would stop talking. Not to be disrespectful, but I'm saying this is because we need to be quoting God's word more than anybody else out there. Yeah, there's some great people and great teachers, and guys, I, I, I get it, but, but you know, I don't want you quoting Clayton. I want you quoting God's word. Now, <laughs> let's move on to Acts chapter 8. Uh, Acts chapter 8, right at the beginning, I'm going to go ahead and read it for everybody. I, uh, 1 through 3, it says, Saul agreed to, uh, with putting him to death. This is talking about uh, Stephen. On that day, uh, several persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all, except the apostles, were scattered throughout the land of Judah and Samaria. Devout men buried Stephen and mourned deeply over him. Saul, however, was ravaging the church. He would enter the house after house, drag off men and women, and put them in prison. Guys, I, I could tell you something here. And, and as I see this, it's interesting to me that we have the account of Stephen, and we have this account with Saul, who became Paul, later on and then we have this account of philip and it's interesting to me because we see this throughout the whole scripture the whole bible multiple accounts of the same thing happening we see this great acts of faith which requires a change 
which is met with persecution of doubters, which then invokes God's movement in his church. So we see this great acts of faith requiring change, like Stephen. Then we see this persecution of doubters, which is Saul's persecution. And he starts hurting people, guys. He starts hurting people. And then after that, we see God's movement in Samaria by, by Philip. It's, it's pretty amazing. Because God's plan and all of this is, is to set this in motion. I mean, it, it's a complete setting in motion. And you can say, well, you know, well, there's no free will. No, there, there is free will in this. But at the same time, there's God's sovereign great plan that's happening. And so because of Stephen's persecution and putting to death, we have this mission that sets place with Saul who will later be converted. And then not only that, but then you have this mission starting to spread out by the church. Because of the persecution, because of this attack on the church, the church then scatters. And But what happens is, is they don't scatter and be quiet. They scatter and start spreading the gospel throughout the land as Jesus claimed for them to do. So you see this. And sometimes we look at some of these things like the persecution as being an, an uh, evil. And I think it can be, guys, don't get me wrong. I think there's something, there's either like some sort of desires, evil desires or motive that, that's a part of being uh, pers in persecution. But for us as believers, it's a great motivator to seek after God. It's a great motivator to spread the good news. We see this in the scriptures and we see it in our own lives. When we feel like we're being um, pressured, when we feel like we're being persecuted, what happens? We as believers start spreading the gospel because we realize, man, this is, this is it. This is the time. This is the time that God put in store for me. This is the where I need to be and I need to spread the gospel. It becomes a great motivator. Guys, I, I, I'm more of a motivator now. I, I'm more motivated during this, this Corona-19 thing than I, than I have been in it for the last year. It's because I'm sitting there like, man, I, I really need to spread the word because what if this was the moment that was going to just, boom, attack everybody? Man, there's, there's so-and-so that's not a believer yet. There's so-and-so that's not a believer. That person's not a believer yet. Man, my own family members aren't believers yet. Man, I, I can't be kidding around with them anymore i can't i can't sit there and go well they're not worth it they're worth it so if, if that's the case if i'm sitting there thinking man uh you know I, well, i'm just kind of playing kid gloves with them and, and kind of talking about them hopefully they see my life which i'm hoping they do but but i'm hoping they see my life and maybe i'll throw a little god verse in there maybe i'll throw a little verse in there or maybe i'll hey you know there's this cool story i just read in the bible but guys, I, we got to be actively motivated in, in sending this message out because if it's not this, Corona-19, it could be the next thing that comes up and we feel persecution and we need to get out there and spread the gospel. Well, you might be saying, Pastor Clay, we can't get out there to spread the gospel. Yes, you can. There's multiple different ways. Pick up a phone. All of us have phones, no matter what. We all have phones. Pick up a phone. Spread the word. Give a word of encouragement. More than anything, tell people where they're going to go. If you died now, where are you going? And I'm talking to you believers also. I want you to think about this. If you die now, where are you going? You know, I was listening to somebody and, and they were commenting about the something and, and I, I'll, it's kind of interesting. It kind of brings it to this point is overall is where you're at right now. Would, be, would Jesus be happy with what you're doing? 
That whole thing is what would Jesus do? But I'm, I'm talking about right now. After you get done listening to the message and you go do this, that, or the other. Can you imagine Jesus being with you right there? Every time you cussed, every time you swore, every time you did something that you shouldn't have done or lied or maybe it was just a little white lie, you know, no big deal. Everything you did, sometimes you might have did something dishonest or, or maybe just, you know, just something not really good or hurtful to people. What do you think Jesus would be doing there? Do you think he'd be laughing with you? Do you think that he would be supporting what you're doing? Do you think that he would, what do you think you would be doing would be honorable to him? Is your life being used to spread the gospel? Is your life being used to spread the gospel? Are you being used right now? Are you there with your open arms saying, God, use me? Philip did. Philip left. He could have just said, you know what? I'm not, I'm not speaking the word of, of God. I'm not doing this. I'm not going to spread the gospel around because I know what's going to happen. Persecution is going to come after me. Saul's going to come after me. So if I just, you know what, lay low and just stop talking, you know what? He's going to walk by. He ain't going to notice me. And then he realizes it's not Saul walking by. It's Jesus walking by and not noticing you. Philip didn't. Philip walked on, and he started making his way down to Samaria. And, and he started proclaiming the gospel, the message of the Messiah that came. He started saying, you know what, this is, this is who I believe in. And just because he was being persecuted didn't mean that he, that he couldn't be used. He was being used in that moment. And we also got to think that right now. Guys, if you feel like you're being persecuted, if you feel like the world's attacking you, I'm going to let you know something. You can still be used by God. Philip is a great example of that. He, Saul was coming after Christians left and right, and he still proclaimed the message of God. He still proclaimed the kingdom is coming. Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is our king. Philip proclaimed the Messiah. He preached. He showed signs. And even people were being healed. Even people were being healed. Not just, not just a little bit of healing. Not just you know, a little cut's been cleaned up and okay. I'm talking about healing. People were being, uh, that were paralyzed, that were brought back up. People that were being um seized by demons that were being healed being possessed people were being healed and people in this city that philip is at great joy came over the city where philip was at and all these things were happening great joy came into the city and this this simon character came into it and and he saw uh, he saw what was going on with philip all these signs and wonders that were going on and 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 simon was known as a a he practiced sorcery and i, and I imagine um <laughs> i don't know if it was what i mean by sorcery i don't know if it was like magic like we know magic today and kind of kind of the the sleight of hand or the the oh that that you know look over here and this is what's going on um, or real um, demonic uh, sorcery, in a sense. Um, possessions, all those things. And you can under, I'm kind of curious here because uh, not knowing this, but, but just thinking about this, you have Simon who was, who was doing these sorcery things here. And there were people that were needing to be healed, that were paralyzed, that were possessed. And you've seen all these other things going on. I wonder if there was a correlation that Simon was producing some of these things, who knows, but nevertheless, Simon saw this power that, um, uh, 
that God was doing. Simon saw the power through Philip that God was invoking, that was he was implementing into the area. And Simon became a believer. He was baptized as a believer. When all this was going on, Peter and John heard about heard about all these wonderful things happening and and they came to the location and when they arrived they they knew they ha- that the people didn't receive the holy spirit they they were baptized in the name of Jesus and 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 they were believers but they have not received the holy spirit so Peter and John laid hands upon them and uh, I'll read it real quick out of 1823 it's um read 8 18 through 23 oh hold on I apologize they laid hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. So when Peter and John got there, they laid hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. At this moment, you have Simon who saw all these things happening. And I imagine that the, the wonders that were happening in Jerusalem when the, when the Holy Spirit arrived and, and they were speaking in tongues and, and, and prophesying and everything else, at that moment that was going on, I imagine that's what happened here in Samaritan where, 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 where the, when the Holy Spirit came upon the people they started representing what was supposed to be there speaking in tongues the evidence of them receiving the holy spirit after this simon saw that the spirit was given through the laying on of the hands of the apostles hands he offered money to them saying give me this power also so that anyone i lay hands on may receive the holy spirit and if you read that, that sounds like, well, okay, maybe he just didn't understand. Maybe he didn't understand that, that you know, that, that you don't need money. He just, maybe he just wanted that power to, to help other people. Because you got to look at the whole picture here. Because if you just took those two, two verses, it doesn't seem really too bad what Simon did. I mean, he, he. He didn't, he only, you know, if you think about it, how do we look at, how do we bar, well, barter with people? Well, I know if I give them money, they're going to give me something in return. If I give them cash or change or my card, I know that I'm going to get groceries back, right? So in our world, in this, in our capitalism mind, we, we believe that the, when we give them, offer money up to something that we're going to get something in return. Uh, <laughs> and that's not what was attending here. Peter heard and felt what was being said here. Peter saw, and if you look at this, Peter told him, may your silver be destroyed with you because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. Well, we have to establish and understand that this was a gift from God. These signs and wonders that were happening that we still have today, these, these things of people being healed by prayer and, and, and by asking God to heal people, by, by the speaking in tongues and all these other things, prophesizing and doing all these things in the name of God, all these things were being done, is not ours, but it is God's. It is not our gift, but it is God's gift that he gave to us to give to others what Simon was trying to do as he was trying to buy in a sense buy his way into heaven buy what he thought he needed to do to to be able to do other things for other people and that's where you have Peter scold him (laughs) very big You have no part or share in this matter because your heart is not right before God. Therefore, repent of this wickedness of yours and pray to the Lord that if possible, it's very interesting, if possible, your heart's intent may be forgiven. For you see you are, uh, for I see you are poisoned by bitterness and bound by wickedness. What's the heart? And my question for us as we're reading this, when we come to church, why are we coming to church? Because us as believers, we have to ask ourselves, why do we come to church? 
Well, we can say, well, it's mandated. Okay. But mm, there's a lot of things mandated, and we still do those things wrong. We, we chose not to do those things. So why do we come to church? Is it to show off our fancy clothes? Is it to impress how holy we are to other people? We come to church to worship. We come to church to hear a message from God, to hear from people and how God's interacting in their lives, to give our testimony to other believers, to get filled. Because throughout our week, our, our cup gets empty, and when we come back to church, it kind of gets filled again. And it's like, okay, man, we can go back out there and do what we need to do. But if our heart on the, our tent to come into church is because we want to show everybody else how holy we are, man, Ooh, we got to be careful. I'm going to go a little bit fast through this. But as this continues on, as, the, as this, this chapter continues on, we see Philip Leaving the area, the angel of the Lord spoke to Philip and says, get up and go south. So he gets up and goes, and he, he takes off. And as he was going, he, uh, he kind of caught up to this uh, Ethiopian man. He was a eunuch. And as he was there, uh, this kind of this, this connection happens, and the spirit told Philip, go and join the chariot where this, where this uh, Ethiopian man was at. And... You see this this interaction between this Ethiopian and and Philip, and they talk, and and as you know, he's kind of a holy man in a sense, and and he he understands some things, but there's some things that he didn't. And so as he comes up to uh, as Philip comes up to him, and and they begin talking, the Ethiopian says, he goes, um, "How can I?" Uh, so let me back up a little bit. Then Philip ran up to uh, to it, and he heard him reading. Uh, the prophet Isaiah said, do you understand what you're reading? How can I, he said, unless somebody guides me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the scripture passage that he was reading uh, was this. He said uh, he was led like a sheep to the slaughter and a lamb to the silent before the shears. So he does not open his mouth in his humiliation. Justice was denied uh, justice was denied him who uh, will describe this generation for his life is taken from the earth and this is that Isaiah, Isaiah 53 7 through 8 and what's awesome about this guys is is actually if you actually read through this whole scripture here this this whole Isaiah 53 and honestly I think it's uh, I want to say uh, 55 is another good one um, right around this area, we're starting to we we see a lot of the prophecies for Jesus and what was happening during um, uh, Resurrection Sunday, uh, Good Friday, all these things that were going on. And again, you have this scripture, and, and Philip is talking to him, and and so you know he the eunuch is like, hey, how what is, what does this mean? And he said, well, let me tell you, let me tell you about this man named Jesus. And he goes and starts talking to him about what happened. During that time. And as he's proclaiming the good news of Jesus. From not only just probably not only his life. But some of the, the facts around Isaiah. And all their different places. He's explaining this and who Jesus is. And as they were traveling. As they were going about. The, the eunuch looked down. And he saw this water. Probably this puddle in a sense. Or this water in this area. And he says what is stopping me from being baptized right now. And so they go down and they baptize. Philip baptizes them. And in that moment, Philip is carried away by the Spirit. But the eunuch goes out rejoicing. I want to tell you a real quick story. And uh, it happened this weekend. And uh, I'm, I'm going to be done after this. And, and honestly, if, if you're still with me, I'm glad. I appreciate it. 
kind of had a lot of uh, a lot of a lot of little attacks on us as as believers. But but please understand my heart on this is guys is because our mission is not just at home. Our mission is wherever we step, wherever our step is at, wherever we are at, we need to be proclaiming the word of God. We need to be proclaiming the kingdom is coming. We need to be proclaiming Jesus. So this last Sunday, uh, we decided not to have church. We were talking about having an outdoor service, which confirmation, guys, I'm glad we didn't because I'll get to the point in just a minute. But uh, we, we decided uh, not to have Sunday church outside. Um, we were talking about having an indoor. We were talking about having an outdoor. And we decided that after looking at everything and kind of feeling the political strain <laughs> on uh, that was out there, we decided that for the best interest of the church, um, our people, and um, not wanting to be used as political patsies, I guess, um, we, we decided that the best thing for the church is is to not have service, still have our online service, but not to have service. Well, last Sunday, um, me and my wife, we felt that there was a strong connection that we needed to come to church. We, we, we felt this conviction of, man, if we don't come, there may be somebody that comes that we didn't get the word out. And we need to at least tell them and be there to tell people, hey, look, this is the reason why we didn't have service. We love you. Thank you for coming. All those type of things. But, you know, we, we're not doing it. But there's another stronger connection to it that we like we had to be here in the parking lot listening to the message, Pastor Bob's message. And it was a beautiful message, wonderful message, guys. So if you have not seen it yet, please step out and see it. Get it, get uh, pull it up on YouTube or the Facebook page. But as we were sitting in the parking lot, um, started playing our message, um, saw one of the neighbors across the street and talked with them for a few moments about everything. And it was wonderful and beautiful conversation, just talking about what, you know, last weekend that we had the outdoor service. And that was really cool, really great interaction and, and everything and support from them, which was awesome. But then right after that, I was in the parking lot with the family. We were listening to Pastor Bob's message. And about one third of the way through, I get a text message that says, so you guys are not having church. Now, now in this moment, I saw this car pull into the back of the parking lot. Um, I didn't know him. I didn't recognize the car, but I saw this car. And so I was like, oh, okay, somebody's there. And eh, it's probably somebody in the neighborhood. No big deal. And I get this message from a friend of mine. And it says, um, so you guys are not having Sunday service? And I said, no, buddy, we're not. You know, this is what we got going on. He goes, oh, okay. And my wife sits there and says, she goes, I wonder if that's them in the car. And I look behind the car and I'm like, no, that's not them. That's not him. I, I know it's not. Um, I know the type of car that that person drives. That's not him. Okay. So I started sitting there. And then I started thinking, well, maybe it is him. Maybe I need to get out of the car. And I said, well, you know what I'll do? I got it. I'll get out of the car. And, and if it's him, I'll open. I mean, if, if, it, if it's him, he'll, he'll see me. I'll go act like I'm trying to get something out of the trunk. And, and then if he does see me, he'll pull forward. And guys, I'm going to tell you right now, I got out of the car, opened up the trunk, and looked over at the car, and sure enough, that car started rolling my way. And I went over there and talked to my brother, who was hurting, um, hurting bad. And this hope or hopelessness that was on his face and in his speech, guys, I can tell you that I've, I've heard it before, felt it before, and know it before. And seeing that, man, the only thing I could do, the only thing I could offer couldn't offer money and riches and fame and all that other stuff. The only thing I can offer is the word of God. And I told him, I said, if you just give your life over to God, if you just 
decide right now and you say, you know what, I'm done trying to do things my way and I'm going to start doing things your way and I'm going to start running and walking in your way and, and I'm going to start reading your word and, and start writing it on my heart and believing it with everything I have and, and I'm just going to give everything over to you because because I, I every time I try to have it, I, and, and I, I screw it up. And guys, I'm going to tell you right now, it may seem like I've rehearsed it. It's not because I've rehearsed it, it's because I know it. I myself have felt this way and I try to hold everything together and everything on but the, every time I do it slips through my hands every single time and I realize that the moment I start giving everything over to him every time I give everything over to him it's on him how awesome is that do you understand what I'm saying that the moment I give everything over to God it's no longer on my shoulders. No, I'm supposed to do things. Don't get me wrong. I'm supposed to study His Word and, 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 try to, and try to live a good life. Don't get me wrong. I'm trying to do these things. And, but I'm talking about the future. I'm talking about the next steps. I'm talking about the hope. I'm talking about the faith that comes with this. Guys, I'm talking about all these other things. When you do that, when you give that over to God, it's on Him. And that's what I told him. God still works in the moments of the, the eunuch. I told him that, and to be honest, guys, I believe this. I believe this wholeheartedly. When Pastor Bob said, hey, kid, what do you think about service? And we, we talked through it and we decided not to have Sunday service. I believe God was already implementing that he's going to do all of these things. He's going to no have service. Worry me and the whole family are going to have to get together and come here at the church at a certain time to meet him here. Everything was done for that one person. Everything was done for him. So all you out there that are like, oh man, why did we not have service? Everything else. You can say, I'm telling you this. Why we didn't have service is because he needed to be reached. God's going to do everything he can for one. You out there believe in the word. You believe in the scriptures, the holy scriptures. You believe in a God He's not looking to come out and save you every single time. He's looking for the one that needs to be saved. And he will put everything in motion for that one person. So when I talked about confirmation, that was my confirmation that I knew that everything was done because of for that one person. And I told him that. And guys, it was done to you too. When you became a believer in Jesus Christ, everything was put into motion for that to happen. I love telling that to him. And as, as I told him that, tears were rolling down his face. That's how much God loves you. He's willing to sacrifice for the one. Great act of faith brings persecution from the doubters, but it invokes God's movement of the church. I did get to tell him because I heard this. And guys, I want to leave this with you. Well, two more things. Pastor Bob said this is last week, and I want to leave it again with you tonight. Do you know the enemy is never secure in his victory over you? That is why he keeps attacking you. Sometimes, this is from a quote I heard from a, from a catcher, Gary Carter. Sometimes you have to play in the pain. Guys, I'm here to tell you, that even in the great moments of persecution from doubters, God's church is moving. The movement of God's church is happening. You don't need to defend God. 
I don't need to defend. I need to recommend. You don't need to defend. You need to recommend your God, your Jesus, your Holy Spirit. Recommend them. I'm going to leave the message with that tonight. Guys, if you have any questions, comments, concerns, please. Um, we have the Facebook page you can contact us on. Um, I've given my phone number out. I'll give it out again. You can text me if you'd like to. Uh, email if you'd like to. It is C-B-A-R-T-H dot D-A-A-G D-A-A-G at gmail.com. And uh, you can get a hold of us. You can get a hold of me. I'm here for you. Uh, I care for you. And I, you might not even know you, but I care for you already. Because God cares for you. He's setting everything in motion for you. Let us pray. Father, just thank you so much for everything you do. Father, I see your hand in all the things that we see and do. And Father, the moment that we step out in some sort of faith or blind faith, Father, you're there and you're guiding our steps. Father, allow us to continue to just seek and save the lost that are out there, Father, to seek you with everything we have. Father, we lift you up in complete worship and complete everything. Father, you are everything. Father, just thank you for the people. Thank you for the, the time. Father, we love you and we give you everything over to you. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. God bless you.